Hello, this is Derek Taylor for HIST 140, U.S. History to 1877. This is just a little intro video for this week's reading for the first two modules, um, well, the first couple of chapters of um, America, Concise History and the, the Major Problems. We're just going to go over the stuff briefly, talk about it a little bit for you guys an introduction. You don't have to watch these videos, but I thought it might give you a little more overview, broad overview of everything uh, that's in these. Your... Um, your uh, the first module deals the modules are taken from the title of these chapters uh one, chapter one in america is called colliding worlds 1450 to 1600 and that deals with um initial exploration and meeting of the both uh you know european settlers with peoples of native america but also the beginnings of the african slave trade um, because that will become obviously one of the primary sources of labor in the new world, uh, as Europeans understand it. And um, one of the things you, know, you kind of should get out of this, uh, when you read these uh, these chapters, they're, they're pretty good. But again, you have uh, one of the things you'll see, the readings will stress as much as they can, is the agency of these native peoples. Uh, um, uh, because they have, um, in the past, historians had emphasized, you know, well, this was, um, this was the, um, you know, the tragedy of these, uh, of these Native peoples being destroyed by these colonial, these, uh, in, you know, imperialist in some ways, uh, settlers. Um, lately, they wanted to, and again, there's other more political views of these things, that um, um, uh, that these native peoples have agency. That is to say, they have their own societies. Your first, the chapter in the textbook, um, America will talk about this. So go into detail about you know, the differences between in um, South America, the peoples there, the Inca, the Aztec, uh, and the various Maya, the various other peoples that are there, and um, people, uh, Native Americans, Natives of, of North America, which have a little more different types of social settlement, even though there's actually long distance trade between the two, um, long before Europeans ever get there. They want to stress that. I'm going to show you they actually had, you know, it wasn't this static, you know, unchanging. Sometimes people, because, you know, again, people are against, you know, uh, European imperialism for obvious reasons, it's easy to idealize native peoples. You know, they were just sort of off being one with nature until it was all ruined by, you know, European colonialism, which is kind of like, you know, the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, but like <laughs> a kind of a secularized thing. Uh, no, they had their own, they had their own political forms. They had, they fought wars with each other. By the time, you know, the, the, uh, Europeans get to uh, North America in the 16th centuries, the peoples um, of the uh, Northeastern United States and Canada, the Iroquois, the Iroquois Indians, uh, they've, they've basically founded their own empire. They've, they've, they've dominated local people where they live. So they wanna stress that in some of these readings that's what you're gonna kind of get here uh, in the first chapter. And in the major problems, the first chapter will have source readings and I'll go through some of this in a second. And let me check onto this actually, click onto it and um, uh, share this uh, textbook, uh, show what it looks like. This is Major Problems in American History, Volume 1, the fourth edition, yada, 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 all that stuff. <clears throat> uh, and you can see the context of the first chapter is called Old World, Old World Make New. And it's about the clash of these, these different civilizations. And it'll give you some stuff here. Um, I did give you the first, uh, you notice, um, it's uh, I give you the first few pages of the preface. And I do that just to give you, again, exposure to um, to what historians, academic historians, professional historians, how they talk about history. And um, yeah, the first few pages, not the preface, but um, this part here, introduction, how to read primary and secondary sources, talks about what they are. The primary source is a piece of evidence that survived from the period in question. And then the, the next um, one we'll talk about um, secondary sources and how historians uh, write their histories, which in themselves are secondary. Secondary because it's a second remove 
from the event, right? I have sources from the past. I write a story about the past. That story about the past is the secondary source. And it also mentions, and this is something you keep in mind, is that you need to treat primary sources with caution. You don't have to, you know, is it from the period in question? Is it authentic? You know, who wrote it? That's why I gave you those assignments. So you will have learned to think to do that when you think about the past a little bit. Uh, I give you the definition of a secondary source here. Secondary source is uh, named because it is one step removed uh, from the primary source. It's the work of historians who have conducted painstaking research in primary documents. And by the way, research usually is pretty painful. So um, that's the first part. And I had you guys read that just to get that into your heads. But every chapter, as you're going to see, is going to have a little introduction. Um, this is not the point of this book. The point of this book are these sources they give you. They give you questions to think about that you can ask you know, um, as you go through these documents. Um, the first one, by the way, is not even a, it's not actually a, um, a written source. It's, a, it's, it's an oral tradition they took from modern day uh, Native Americans and wrote down. So stuff like this, and they'll give you, you know, excerpts here um, um, from the Iroquois, uh, you know, painting a uh, picture uh, from uh, the Aztecs uh, in the 1540s. All of those sorts of things. And uh, again, European accounts, stuff like this, stuff from Christopher Columbus, those sorts of things. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I go through this. And then the one I only assigned uh, the first essay, it's called The Indian's Old World. And again, this is by Neil Salisbury. It's an excerpt of his, uh, his article uh, from a journal. It just talks about, okay, what, you know, what Native Americans were doing before Europeans got to the new world, right? They've been there for, you know, you know, centuries. And uh, it, it, first of all, by the way, you're talking about what sources are used. They don't have written sources, most of these civilizations. So they have to use archeology. span And then again, oral tradition to try to get at these things um, occasionally. A little different with the Aztec. They did have, you know, higher level civilization, but he's, he's talking about different peoples from uh, the Americas, generally speaking there. So that's the uh, that's the major problems for that one. So, so that's the first one there. The second uh, module. I'll get back onto this. Whoop. Just briefly. Whoa. And this is due a few days from now. Uh, colonial experiments. This is I think it's called American experiments now in your textbook, um, but it's about the, the process of um, uh, the European powers establishing colonies in these various places, uh, about the different types of colonies they established, uh, that chapter in America. Um, because again, we tend to think that again, you know, Europeans, we tend to read back later history into earlier periods. That's called anachronism, by the way. It's a term you should know and avoid it. Um, because Europe becomes the most dominant power in the world from the 19th century, even earlier than that onward, we tend to look back a lot of times popular views of, of, of this era in popular culture now reflect this, right? Because we're very concerned about people who were mistreated in the past, that you have these bloodthirsty, you know, these Span Spanish conquistadors with their, you know, whatever their Christian religion, they're going to impose it on the Aztecs and all this stuff. And there's something to that, but it's very partial. I mean, just giving an example, I'm talking about agency, right? If you don't know the Aztec peoples, um, the Aztec was not a single people. It's not the name of a race. It's the name of an alliance, actually. Uh, the Triple Alliance. There's actually three peoples involved in the Aztec Empire. Um, the uh, main, well, there's two other ones. I can't remember their names. I think Plox Collins is one of them. But they're the junior partners. The dominant part of that alliance is called the Mexica. And that, by the way, we spell that as M-E-X-I-C-A. They're the, they're the an ancient ancestors of, of modern day Mexico. And the Mexica were the dominant power. And they're the ones who they, they you know, they created this empire by conquest, basically. And um, it's not too going too far to say that, you know, again, you probably heard, you know this, that the Aztecs had a very sophisticated civilization in some ways, some ways more sophisticated than the Europeans. The Spanish came there and conquered them. On the other hand, and this may sound harsh or excessive, but it, I think you can fairly call the Aztec state a terrorist state. And no, I'm being serious. Um, as I'm sure you know, most 
peoples and early peoples in South America practice some sort of human sacrifice, not very much, not very often. Um, but the Aztecs practiced this on a just much greater scale. A and um, the estimates of how many people were put to death in, and you've seen, you know, if you don't know anything about this, part of the whole ritual was they would, you know, take the person and like remove their heart while they were living to sacrifice them to the Aztec gods. And um, reason why I mentioned this, they, they think it's the estimates are something upwards of a hundred thousand people. They found their their empire in the 1430s. By the time the Spaniards get there, they they put it up about a hundred thousand people. And why would you do that? Well, it's probably because of the empire building. Uh, it's probably we think the best guess is it's a way of intimidating their subject peoples. I um, you know, it used to be by the way historians because you'd have these stories right written by you know the Spanish friars, the Catholic priests who went there and to bring uh, Catholicism to this place. And historians used to dismiss these stories because they tell these stories, right? Uh, but there was a temple in Mexico City where the Aztecs had this a pyramid surrounded by racks of skulls. And it was this really like almost like a horror movie or something. You, like this is totally like, how horrible is that? That they made up this story about these native peoples. Well, archaeologists have actually found the racks that those priests describe with the skulls on them, like thousands of them. So again, this, by the way, this doesn't excuse conquest at all. Don't get me wrong. But like, again, it's not quite as simple. It's not, it's not a Manichaean black and white thing uh, when we talk about this. Again, a lot of, and besides the, you know, the, you know, the gruesome stuff I just mentioned, most of what, of course, kills these Native Americans is not even warfare, it's disease, which uh, the Europeans, you know, brought with them and just the Native Americans hadn't been exposed to. So, again, I'm not trying to, like, excuse anybody of anything, but it's a little bit different when you start thinking about them in those terms. That's why I like what the textbook does. It gives the Native people some agency. This wasn't totally inevitable um, that Europeans would take over. They did have it, and they had guns, right? That's the big thing, right? If you you know, the technological advantage to a certain degree, but there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. And a lot of this, these types of uh, things. Anyway, these chapters deal with this and major problems in America. Uh, talks about, especially America does, the different types of colonies that were found. That's, again, that's another thing about this. It wasn't as if every European power came there for the reason of, of, of stamping out another culture and imprinting theirs on these peoples. Most of them came there, I mean, to, to get rich. <laughs> and in fact, a lot of the colonies were founded, as you'll see, people like New France, right? The French get into Canada. They were just there to trade. They wanted furs because they were, you know, they sold for a lot of money back in Europe. The Dutch, for example, had real no, no real interest in, you know, propagating their culture. They just wanted to trade. Uh, the Dutch were a trading nation. It's the British and the, and the French do eventually start settling Quebec, or even, even at the end of their period when the British eventually kicked them out, it's never as populated as the British are. Um, and so in Britain and sp the Spanish colonies, you that's where you get, they call them plantation colonies, but you'll get what eventually people call settler societies, where you do have European settlers, you know, pushing out or dominating native peoples like that. So it talks about some of those things in those chapters uh, in uh, America, seeing discussions of those things and then again we'll share this one more time the chapter in major problems chapter two Whoop. Uh, let me see this here yeah chapter two is called colonial sediments and conflicts uh basically goes along with this it also talks about conflicts that go on within um colonial society european colonial societies there's a couple uh, at the end of the 17th century um, this th this talks about you know conflicts between Native Americans, especially British. This this chapter we get into the British because they're the ancestors of the Americans here. Obviously, um, you can see some of the stuff in major problems, but also different types of colonies. Uh, Puritan New England, which of course founded for explicitly religious le uh, religious le reasons, as opposed to Jamestown and Virginia, which was again founded to make money, right? Eventually does to back out. It also talks about, I'm glad they have an uh, article in here about Barbados. That's another, we don't talk about it here because it's not part of our country now, but the British founded their colonies, founded some colonies in the Caribbean. I mention that because they're actually the most valuable to them in the long run. Why? Because they produce sugar. That's the most valuable thing uh, that you can get from the new world. 
Uh, and so they begin, you know, sugar plantations become a big money maker. And of course, sugar, sugar, sugar production is really brutal work. So that's what they begin importing African slaves in large numbers really first is into the Caribbean to the British. I should say the English still in the 17th century. They don't get to be called the British until the 18th century, but you have some more stuff in here encounters, you know, French missionary describes the Iroquois. Again, um, a uh, resident of Maryland are talking about indentured servitude, another interesting subject because you have slavery in the early colonies. You also have indentured servitude, which is, again, servitude's a nice way of saying slavery. It's time limited. You, you sell your labor for a few years, but if you know anything about this, I mean, people who are indentured servitudes, who were, again, white Europeans, they could be treated pretty much as badly as, as slaves in a lot of respects. One of the things I would do in my live class, if you're in, in, in class here, in my lecture, I would I show, I show some uh, advertisements from 18th century colonial America, advertised for the sale of slaves, right? Which is a rule, you know, it's a hard thing, to, it's disgusting. But I put it next to an advertisement for an indentured servant. And I asked my students to like spot the difference. It's, it's harder to tell than you think. Uh, an indentured servitude, by the way, existed into the early American Republic. It wasn't ended by the revolution. It was actually, but it took some decades. But but um, it's a different sort of society prior to the American Revolution. It's not a modern society. Um, in pre-modern societies, there were varying levels of what we call servitude. So it's an interesting thing uh, to think about. Again, try not to be anachronistic when you read this stuff. If you can, stuff from the Seven Wish Trials and then um, I believe the second one, I did give you the other, I can't remember which one I signed. <laughs> Here, I'm going to check those really quickly. Uh, yeah, this uh, page 54. Yeah, so you would, uh, okay, uh, yeah, I give you the first essay here, which is the the Indian's New World, uh, which is about, um, again, how Indians adjusted to, again, this is more what you're probably expecting is, oh, okay, how did their lives get changed by the uh, Europeans and how they adapted to it. That's what James Merrill's essay is about. There are the excerpts from his uh, from his essay. So um, so you have that. So this takes you up to um, about 1700 or so, um, which gets us into the American colonial period in which America is born, which is in the 18th century when there's more population, they begin to trade more with the mother country, and that'll. Uh, sort of bring the narrative up to that point. So yeah, um, have some fun with that this week. You know, um, you know, um, think of uh, some good questions for for the discussion forum. And um, yeah, uh, email me if you have any questions. And so that's it. It's a little intro for this week. Uh, have a good uh, have a have a good uh, week, you guys. Take care.